OK, let's get going. Um, I'm sure a few more will uh, join as we uh, as we go through um, the session. So. Welcome and good afternoon and thank you for joining us for today's session that's looking at the uh, Siri VM profile um, that's been produced for the Bus Open Data program. Um, we're going to look at both the profile and some of the data matching issues. Um, this is a Q&A session, so whilst I'm going to run through the headlines, I'm not going to go into um, every minutiae because there's not enough time. So um, I am very much after questions. Um, please use the chat. Um, and um, once I've run through it, um, we can get into uh, discussion about uh, any of the things that uh, you want some uh, clarification on or got some questions. Um, but I uh, really do want this to be a, uh, a two way. So a um, bit of um, background. Um, the Siri VM profile is being produced because as part of the bus open data program, there is a requirement on um, all bus operators with registered services to publish, as I'm sure you're well aware by now, timetables, fares and location data. Um, and the um, regulation requires the use of Siri VM for that vehicle location data. Um, there has been some technical guidance available on Siri VM for BODs um, for over a year now on the uh, on the DFT site. Um, that was put up to um, help people um, start to submit data um, to the uh, to the port BODs portal um, before the end of last year. Um, earlier this year, um, I suspect quite a lot of you were involved in some KPMG work where they were looking at um, the um, key data requirements for data consumers um, initially um, from BODs. So the sort of things that app developers and journey planners and um, Display providers um, were going to want from um, the uh, the Siri VM coming out of BODs. Um, and they did that in June and July, and they also um, spent some time talking to system providers to uh, try and make sure that uh, what was uh, coming out um, from that work was um, something that was going to be able to be uh, delivered. Um, out of that work um, came um, three categories um, of um, compliance for submitting Siri VM data. Um, so for those of you that have been involved in submitting timetable data, um, you'll, you'll be used to um, the timetable validator and what it does. Um, there are some things that you absolutely have to provide, otherwise it gives you a red flag and goes, go away, please try again. Um, and there are other things that it goes, well, you know, that's not quite up to scratch or, you know, you ought to be providing this as well. Um, and uh, that goes into a, a quality score. So for Siri, um, there are a list of mandatory fields. These are the things that you have to provide if you don't your feed uh, won't pass. Um, and there are then some uh, data elements that um, we would like you to be providing um, that um, data consumers have said are really important. Um, and to be able to get the full compliance tick, you need to be providing all of them. Um, so, um, 
the profile document that was circulated a few weeks ago that we're seeking um, feedback on um, has three sort of key um, target audiences. Um, one is suppliers, um, so that they know what they need to be providing for their customers, making sure their systems can provide it. Um, bus operators, technical staff, we are assuming that there is some awareness of um, Siri VM um, in the document. We're not going back to um, scratch with it. Um, so it is more technical staff in bus operators um, who need to be making sure that their uh, systems and their suppliers are going to be able to provide compliant data. Um, and then um, developers and technical managers in data consumers, the people who we're really doing this for, so that they can then provide uh, useful information to customers. Those are the three target audiences. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is, does it hit the mark for those three um, groups? Do we need to be adding more in for some of them? Um, or is it OK? So when you're providing um, Siri to BODS, there's a two stage validation process in the same way that there is for um, transit exchange for the timetables. And this is now live. There is a schema compliance check. So I, is what you are providing um, meeting the minimum requirements of the schema? Um, that's hopefully not too hard to um, achieve. Um, and that's doing that against the 2.0 Q schema release, um, which has been out for a good number of years now. Um, and then we move on to either the data um, PTI um, compliant. Um, it's checking the um, uh, mandatory fields, making sure that they're there. Um, where they're over and above the schema, um, and uh, is the content um, looking as though it is um, valid? And that went live um, uh, a few weeks ago, earlier this month. So um, validation is looking for the key data fields. So producer ref, who's producing this data, um, the response timestamp, um, and then under um, monitored vehicle journeys, a number of things like recorded at time and valid until time, um, which are sort of system generated things. Um, then we've got line ref, um, direction ref, operator ref, the bearing of the vehicle at that point in time. Um, there has been some um, questions and debate about shouldn't that bearing be um, coming from NAPTAN? No, because NAPTAN is the bearing of the bit of road that the bus stop is on at that point. The bearing in Siri is the direction that the vehicle is going in at that point. Um, the two are different, um, and so it is not the same as the NAPTAN bearing. Um, then vehicle journey ref, which is perhaps something that some of you might want to um, come back to um, where the bus is at the moment um, and um, a vehicle ref. Partial um, compliance, the things that we would like you to be providing, published line name, um, where it's coming from um, and going to. That includes the NAPTAN um, stop references um, and block ref. Um, now, again, block ref might be something that uh, you want to uh, to pick up, um, but these at the moment, whilst they're partial compliance, um, at some point in future, um, these will migrate to being essential data because these are all things that data consumers have said is really important for their ability to provide good quality customer information. That's something to um, watch out for and plan for. 
um, and then full compliant um, is all of the um, those data fields. So um, within the document, there is a table that um, covers um, each of the fields um, and where it matches with something. So for example, line ref, um, actually that needs to match in the Trans Exchange PTI profile with line name. And the whole point of matching um, and the need for this profile um, is so you can take the timetable data and you can take the location data and you can do something with it usefully together. You can match it. Um, and so each of the fields has got uh, an entry in the table and where it's, um, as I say, where there's a need to match, it tells you about that. And it also says where the data is coming from. So, for example, vehicle location, you're going to get that from your uh, from your GPS or your AVL kit. So they're all in there. Um, in terms of updating data, there is a requirement for each vehicle to be updating um, when it's uh, active uh, and on service every 30 seconds as a minimum. Um, the higher the frequency, the better. Um, there is a nominal, um, please don't supply it more than um, every 10 seconds. Um, that's a capacity um, uh, management um, figure. Um, if and when um, people can provide data more frequently than that, then that's something that, uh, that we want to explore with you. Um, and um, that's something that um, a project with the Transport Technology Forum, which is going to start in January, um, is going to have a look at and explore what are the possibilities and what can you actually do with a much higher frequency uh, of updates. Um, the Siri feed itself, so not the vehicles, but the Siri feed needs to be providing a heartbeat every 30 seconds. Um, so, uh, at three o'clock in the morning, if you've got no wheels turning, um, to make sure that the uh, the the your systems um, are up and running, um, that connection, that subscription still needs to be providing a heartbeat every 30 seconds, just so Bods knows that everything's still uh, connected and working, even if you haven't got any vehicles moving around. So um, the whole purpose of the profile is to help with data matching. Um, there's a number of key things um, for that. So we're wanting the data validated, and making sure it's compliant because that makes it easier for people to match the data and provide what we're really trying to do here, which is the um, predicted time, so the calculated arrival time at a bus stop. Um, yeah. And the quality of data keeps coming back from data consumers as well as the public as really important to them. So the better the quality data, the more trust that's there um, and the better customer experience it's provided. Um, and yes, it is important to achieving BOD's outcomes, um, but that's secondary for most of you. The primary thing is going to be the customer experience and wanting to provide as good a customer experience as possible for your passengers. Uh, it's also important for Analyze Bus Open Data Service, um, which is how the department is going to collect your on-time performance. So if there isn't good matching, the data in the Analyze Bus Open Data Service isn't going to be as good as it would be. Um, and um, the uh, on-time performance data isn't going to be as good. Um, and so you're more likely to be uh, questioned over it. And um, providing good quality predictions and customer information uh, appears in every bus service improvement plan that I've read. I've not read them all, but I've read most of them. Um, and so um, that's something that um, as authorities, you're going to want to be making sure your operators are providing. 
but if you're an operator, you're going to want to be making sure that uh, you're providing it as well so authorities can um, distribute it. So the detail of the matching, um, the preferred way of matching Siri and Trans Exchange is based on vehicle journey ref um, and using that effectively as a unique identifier for a journey um, within a line. Um, it would be really nice to get to the point where vehicle journey ref is unique across all journeys within England, but we recognise that that's a level of coordination that would be really quite difficult to achieve at the moment. So um, we are um, accepting that actually, as long as it's unique within line ref, um, within an operator, um, that will do. Um, so preferably vehicle journey ref, and ideally you've got block ref in there or somewhat, you know, because that's really important for providing cross journey predictions. Um, and one of the um, things that keeps cropping up in research in different authorities um, is poor performance in the first few stops of real time systems are a, uh, a, a problem for customers and the way to overcome that is making sure we can provide cross journey predictions. So block ref is really important there. And I know that's uh, that's uh, got some challenges for some of you. Um, if that doesn't work, then the document proposes um, a, an alternative suggested approach, um, which is something that um, real time systems have used um, in years gone by in the days where authorities managed and supplied the data as well as the, the kit. So you're then starting to look at where that journey's origin is um, and where it's going to. Um, and um, probably in vehicle journey ref, something to do with the departure time in, in the PT from trans exchange. Um, departure time from the origin um, because uh, a driver is probably going to log into a ticket machine with that if you don't have uh, journey numbers or uh, something akin to that. So getting hold of the documents, um, the current DFT guidance is on the DFT site. Um, the URL is there, but it's easier just to uh, to do a search in your favourite search engine for bus open data Siri um, and you'll get there. Um, the draft profile document is on the RTG website. Um, a copy of the slides um, will be on there um, as well as recording of this session um, and um, future drafts um, will be on there as well. Um, as you will have seen from the um, emails that went out uh, with uh, copies of the draft profile, um, we're seeking comments and feedback on the profile until Christmas and then um, early in the new year, we'll publish a revised version, um, taking on board um, as many of those uh, comments and um, challenges as we can. Um, so that was a quick run through um, the document and what we're trying to achieve. So let's open the floor now for questions and comments from people. So we've got one already. Oh, no, we've got loads. Right, OK, let's pick them up. Um, so in the question from David, can we confirm destination name is no longer required? Um, and why origin name still is? Um, so um, the um, destination ref is destination name isn't um 
and origin name is um and that comes from the data consumers they they were the data sets that they were saying was really important um it's not a problem to add a destination name in if there is a enough of a feeling that that ought to be in there it was just on one of the original lists and it's it's difficult to get it as the common name because not all operators use it so if we were getting rid of the destination name getting rid of the origin name might help as well because i could actually understand it the other way if they wanted to know the destination but knowing the origin seems a bit odd yeah yeah okay so you would um be interested in removing origin name then david it would make it one step simpler and it would mean that operators who don't use the common name in their um, description of the stop for their drivers uh, wouldn't then get non-compliance yeah okay noted thank you um mark thank you yes the bearing and siri vm um is a way to show um which way the bus is traveling in a map view yeah it's useful um nick supplies brock ref is not already a required field because it assists cross journey matching um yes that's very clearly the feedback that we've had from data consumers but we know that there are a significant number of operators that have problems providing that at the moment um, and um, we actually want to do something that is achievable um, in the short term but that's also why the warning that um, the partial compliance fields will move to um, uh, essential um, at some point in future um, Uh, from Michael, many smaller ops do not use set vehicle working because it's a block ref. Yeah, they're able to be flexible on a day to day basis. Yeah, so those are the sort of things that we need to work through and resolve to be able to move it into a um, into a mandatory um, field. Um, Mark. Uh, in ideal world, Siri ET was designed to update a published timetable and thus could update block ref as and when needed. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, going back uh, a number of years now, um, when the um, open data requirements were being originally discussed, uh, Siri ET was something that was discussed, but certainly at the time it wasn't well supported enough um to be something that the department thought it could uh, mandate um but um as we move forward um we will see but yes not being able to use it at the moment does cause some challenges um Talking about smaller operators without the resources to feed into their schedules by day, especially if you're using agents to input the data. Um, yes, um, some of the conversations that are going on with some of the agents um, at the moment that are providing timetable data um, is how are they going to make sure that operational data such as um, vehicle journey references um, are going to match between um, the uh, the scheduled data and the and the Siri VM um, because uh, that's a uh, that is a concern. Um, many smaller operators also don't have matching IDs from published data to the Siri. ET and VM when relying on a driver to manually key it in. Um, yeah. Which is why um, using unique references and things like that, things that can be looked up against 
um, uh, what a driver is entering into a ticket machine of things that we've talked about with uh, with uh, some of the uh, ETM suppliers. Yeah. Okay. Are there any more questions and thoughts? So those aside, which uh, we're therefore fairly happy. As I say, I've not had much beyond um, comments and thoughts about uh, about block ref and bearings from people. Uh, how have DFT engaged with smaller operators? Um, so um, back in the summer, um, not only were there interviews with um, the big five, um, some of the smaller operators, um, and I forget how many it was um, that were supplying um, timetable data at the time, um, were involved in the um, conversations. So we've tried, but as as you can probably appreciate, small operators. Uh, there's an awful lot of them and they're all very different um, and they're really quite challenging to uh, engage with. Um, if you've got some ideas about how we can um, have some quick conversations, Michael, with, with some that you think are worth doing, then yeah, please feel free to uh, to let me know. OK, has anybody else got any thoughts and questions? We're generally happy with it then. Do we think it's achievable? I'm sorry, I've there. Uh, Austin, just a bit. Mark, yes. Are you trying to say? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yeah. Sorry, Rick. I told you about um, On the. Um, the vehicle journey ref, is there any anything into how that should be populated? Because some operators have the trip ID as published in the Trans Exchange, and some from some serial feeds have uh, something completely built up with a mixture of journey time, date, and some other bits and bobs in there, which don't, think, don't actually lead to the interpretation. Yeah, so we haven't provided advice on what should be in it because the key thing we actually want is for it to match the vehicle journey code in the Trans Exchange. Um, to allow that match, and we know that different people do it in different ways. So we didn't want to trigger a whole um, cascade of change and development for um, the majority of people um, by choosing something that that you know um, few were doing at the moment. So we have left it open, um, but it does need to match between the two. Um, We can provide some examples um, if you think that will be helpful of, of what operators do. See, one of the problems is that we haven't got all the trans exchange loaded into our ticket machines. We don't submit all the ticket, uh, all the trans exchange to BODs, so we don't know the vehicle journey ref. So either the driver's got to key it in or we've got to have another way of um, sending that information over. Yeah. And it's just that reason that uh, leaving it as open as we can enables a number of different 
solutions. But I do recognise, David, that uh, that it's that it's challenging for ticket machine suppliers such as yourselves that don't necessarily have um, all of the data at the moment. Um, but it is up to the operators to make sure that that data matches because it is their obligation. No. OK. Um, in which case, um, as I said, um, please, um, if you didn't haven't seen the document yet, bob onto the RTG website and you can download it or look at your email. Um, if you didn't get it on email, let me know because I can then add you into the onto the um, PTIC and RTG um, uh, email lists. Um, we're open for comments on the 0.2 version until Christmas um, and we'll update that and then uh, issue a, uh, a new version early in the new year um, and leave that open for a couple of weeks for comments um, and um, that will hopefully get us to the end of January with a release of a, of a final version of it. OK, if there's nothing else, then thank you for your time this lunchtime. Um, have a really good Christmas and New Year um, and see you uh, the other side. Thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.